Okay. Um, so we left off on anisotropy. We'll have to probably speed up a little bit so that we don't run too much over. Um, there are a number of different ways of calculating it. Um, you shouldn't be too concerned with the actual formulas because none of them are right or wrong. They're all just different for different cases. Um, if we kind of look at what these formulas actually mean, the easiest way to do this is to kind of do it visually. And so we take here a number of test objects where we go from a perfect circle to a completely elongated um, line almost. And we calculate how do these values look for that image. And unfortunately, this is a little bit confusing because this goes from 0 to 5. And this is going the other direction. So 0 here corresponds to that, and 5 here corresponds to that. So, And so if we start off with 0, we see one of these formulas gives us a value of 5,000. One gives 1, 1, 2. And then if we go down to kind of the other extreme, 5, all of them give us 0. But sort of how they go from their maximum value to their minimum value looks very different. And so what we can start to see is if we try to sort of shift this y extent from 0 to 5, we end up with this number of different curves. And so depending on what exactly we're looking at, we get a very different result. Um, many of these curves are very similar. Um, I would advise against this curve here, the top one, because it makes it difficult to do things later with your data set. So when you're looking at something that has a value range between 0 and 5,000 or infinity, but most of the values fall between 0 and 1, as we see here. I mean, for most normal shapes, that will be the distribution. It will be very difficult to take something like an average and have that be meaningful. Because if you take the average of infinite and a bunch of zeros, you end up with infinite. Or, you know, 5,000 and a bunch of zeros is still several hundred. And that means that a single object that looks like this, that's sort of almost a line or a noise, will compensate not for one object like this, but for a hundred or a thousand objects like that when you're doing something like an average. And so you typically don't want to do averages where objects that aren't that different have wildly different values. And so it would generally be considered that this definition of anisotropy is not a great one for doing later analysis. But these other ones are all fairly similar and we start to look at, you know, sort of randomly sized objects. If we kind of have uniform distributions of x and y, how do the distributions of the anisotropy look? And we can see that, you know, this isotropic one sort of has a spread that goes out very large here. And this um, other curves have very different ones. And that this, um, yeah, they're very different and deciding which one's the best depends a lot on your use case. Yeah. So this would be used as a metric to categorize something inside of it. So you could look for an isotropic you could look for cells with an anisotropic index of whatever and then you would classify put that into the category. Yeah. Like that. So that's exactly what we do in the first exercise here, um, or the, yeah, the first one. So this single object analysis one, it's on the course website link. And so we use the anisotropy to classify the objects we have here into the category of green, which is isotropic, and red, which is anisotropic. And so this gives us a very simple way of classifying. And so for the classification task, 
the choice of metric is actually irrelevant. Okay. And then so you have some kind of trades that would be possible you can say this is a nice Right. That would be the full machine learning approach way of trying to assessing which value worked best for that. Um, yeah. Uh, with the picking of the values, the important part there would be that um, more when you're doing statistics or something afterwards, where you're trying to show that, for example, if you know that these cells, which is probably easier to point here, that these cells are alive and these cells are dead, if you wanted to show there's a difference between the anisotropy of these cells, then you would probably want to pick a factor where the average of the anisotropy or where the range of the anisotropy was between 0 and 1, not 0 and infinity. Because then when you try to do the statistics, if you had one little line here, then you would say the average um, anisotropy of these cells is 25,000. And it's, well, there was one cell that had a really, really, really high anisotropy, but everything else was very low, so that average is actually meaningless. Whereas if you're using one of these other definitions, that average has more meaning. And that's sort of always the case, because what you'll see, particularly in scientific works, where you're in some a new area, you're not just copying what someone else did before, is that you will very frequently have to come up with new metrics to quantify the things that you are interested in. And so, you know, for these cells, anisotropy is very important, but maybe um, you want to quantify like how bean-like the cells are. And so when you're looking at the cell, you know, how round are the edges and how straight are the parts in between, and you call this factor bean-likeness or something that when you calculate that and you make a formula for that, you want to make sure that the distribution of that value has a reasonable range, and that when you do statistics on it later, it will not be massively thrown off by very small changes in the images. And that's one of the sort of important ideas from this anisotropy is that when you create metrics or when you use metrics, you want to make sure that they're sort of fairly robust and stable and this is something one of the guest lecturers would talk about who worked at Roche, where they come up with a lot of these different metrics for cell biology, because they have machines where they just put in trays of cells, where they've applied different compounds, and they want to see which compounds work well against which diseases. And so they have software that are called, I think, cell profilers, one of them, where it will create, you know, 10,000 different metrics quantifying everything imaginable about the cell. You know, the ratio between the cell volume and the nuclear volume, the sort of spikiness of the cell boundary, kind of everything imaginable. And these parameters, some of them are very interesting, but if they're not statistically sort of sound or stable, it's very difficult to use them for a lot of different purposes. And so you want to be aware when you're taking metrics to kind of look at that. And so with anisotropy, what we've done is kind of say, well, if you have randomly sized objects, you know, here it's a circle or an ellipse that we just stretch out the sizes in each direction because that's very easy to simulate. We can then show how the um, anisotropy changes as we change those lengths. And then we can pick from this which distribution or which behavior we like the most or seems to most represent what we're actually looking for in the image. And so that's really the important part of this is that when you're coming up with new metrics or when you're picking out metrics from a large table to use, that you do some of these analyses to kind of decide which ones are the best ones to use. Because if you use the wrong ones here, you might end up with problems later that would have been avoided had you picked a better or more stable one in the first place. And that usually when you're looking at this, you know, you don't have, you have kind of a nice, small, very similar, homogeneous collection of images. 
And then when you actually apply it sort of in production or in larger experiments, you have much more noise, you have, you know, someone didn't focus the machine, someone used the wrong illumination, someone didn't put enough dye. And so then you have a lot more problems that you're probably less able to assume your images will be perfect and more likely to get very bad responses from it. Um, but yeah, so if we go back to this, we can now represent sort of the extents with all objects. So we have all the labeled cells here. We can then show all the center of masses with extents as little lines. We can then take this and kind of show for each how all of the cells we have look when you kind of show them in a little plot by themselves to kind of see what our images actually look like and what objects we've classified as cells. So we now have the extents. We now have the bounding box, which is kind of the same as the extent. So you kind of move the cross from the outside to the, from the inside to the outside. And now we take one of these isotropy metrics and we sort by anisotropy. And so now here we see the least anisotropic and here the most anisotropic. So this one's a perfect square. This one's kind of an elongated rectangle. And when we look at the bounding boxes, this seems to fit very well. And what's also quite nice here is that we have small squares and large squares that are classified the same way because anisotropy doesn't really care how big your object it is. It's just looking at the ratios between them. <coughs> and what we see is that sort of a bounding box is a poor approximation. And so when we show oh, you don't see it exactly inside of here. But when you look at the bounding box and you look at the anisotropy score, you have a bounding box like this, which is almost perfectly square. And the object inside it is quite anisotropic. So if you looked at this as a person, you would see that and say that looks, you know, it looks like Florida or Cuba, and it's quite anisotropic. And so when you take that, the bounding box isn't giving you a very good estimate for the dimensions or the size of the object because it's mostly full of air. So it's just looking at sort of the minimum and the maximum points. How can we get this to be a better approximation? And so do you have any ideas for this? What? Enclose an ellipse, yeah. So that's what we do. We use this elliptical model. And how would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you rotate everyone and see for if at one point the bounding box will have a minimum in one direction and this yeah. direction and then you know which direction it is the most anisotropic? Yeah. So that's one of the I mean easily explainable approaches. Eclipse of, or the open C V approach is what we'll talk about later, how that actually works. But yeah, to take the bounding box and then just rotate it and see which angle makes the smallest bounding box or which angle has the highest amount of pixels to white space as a rough approximation for which way the object faces. Another thing maybe take a, you can take a Fourier transform on the region mm -hmm. and look uh, where, where the longest uh, the longest spikes are. Yeah. And then automatically this is the shortest uh, distance in the red space. It will save all the rotations. The longest spikes. I think for some images it will be. I don't know if it's always the shortest. I mean, it's the direct. The directions match up so that when you have like really narrow things or narrow edges, that that's the case. But if you have more complicated objects like this. I'm not necessarily sure that that's guaranteed to give you, but it would be an interesting approach. 
So that would work as well. Um, so there are a number of ways of, of doing this. So this is one where you orient all the boxes, assume the object is some sort of ellipse, and you know you could do like a curve fitting, where you try to fit a curve to all the points where you know you have a parametric representation of ellipse. Um, and then one of the things that kind of as an intro to next lecture is that if you don't worry about the height and width, you can focus on other characteristics like curvature, like thickness, like some of these other parameters, and try to analyze that in itself rather than trying to analyze the pixels inside the box, uh, inside your object. So one of the useful tools we have is called principal component analysis. And since most of you have heard of it before, we'll go through this quickly. Um, but the idea is to kind of find the most important source of variation inside of a multivariable data set. And so, you know, with a very simple example here, if you had something like the price of corn and the price of chickens over time, you sort of have the, these prices kind of going up and down on their own in different patterns. And so it's a little bit similar to k-means in what we do. And we start off with a series of points in a vector space. And so basically every day here is a point. And the vector space is chicken price is one axis and corn price is another axis. And so what we do with PCA is rather than looking for distinct groups, we try to find sort of how can we rotate these axes so that we get the largest source of variation on the first axis and the second largest on the second axis and so on. And so it's really just a rotation of the space that you have. And so why we have the example with chicken and corn price is that this is fairly easy to understand that these two would be fairly well linked, but there's probably a few tiny things which lead to a difference between them. And so what you do, you can apply this principal component analysis to it, and you see that there's sort of the strongest component, which is here, and then there's the second component, which sort of explains the differences between chicken and corn. And so, you know, this component might be like the price of fuel or something else, and then these are just the components or just the part which explains that difference. And so that gives us a idea of how we can separate or look at these two different data sets, which have a lot of overlapping information, and just focus on one or two different things. And so what that means, so yeah, we have here the principal component one, the price, and we've sort of separated them out into different components. And we'll do the same thing for images. And what's nice about images is that we can visualize this very well. And this is much tougher to visualize with actual data sets. And so here we have all of the pixels inside of the original cell, so the x-axis and the y-axis. And we can then perform a principal component analysis on this so that we get the longest axis in this direction. So this is the first principal component and the shortest axis in that direction. And so effectively what we've done is we've found the optimal rotation for our sample so that the longest axis is horizontal. And so that makes a lot of the things we do later much easier because we know they're now all oriented the same way and we don't have to rotate a box around or do a Fourier transform or any of these other steps because we have a very simple approach for extracting that, which can be efficiently applied to millions of cells and doesn't require any parameterization. So you don't have to pick you know, how do you do the principal component analysis, or how do you weight everything, or how many components you look for, this is all predetermined, and so this makes it a little bit easier to work with than something where you're like, how many different steps should you take for the rotating the bounding box? And so if we look at how we actually calculate it, the thing we do is we take the covariance matrix of all of these pixel values, we then break it down into this eigenvalue decomposition. And so we end up with eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And these are shown on the image like this. And so this blue arrow 
it's the largest eigenvector. And this is the associated eigenvalue. And the red value is the second eigenvector and the associated eigenvalue. And so this is the representation of the information we get, which allows us to transform it into this principal component axis. And so once you get these eigenvectors and eigenvalues, you actually have all the information you need about the orientation and everything else. Um, so it's sort of very easy to calculate this value. There's, you know, functions that do this automatically for you. If you look at the exercises that we do, um, this is already calculated for us. And so you don't actually have to calculate it yourself. Um, if you look at the reg um, props function in Python, or the shape analysis that we have, it already has the sort of inertia tensor, which is what we call this, in it, and all of the moments and the orientation. So you don't have to come up with this yourself. It's about understanding where this is actually coming from and what cases this is useful for. And so when we look at this, if we were to take this um, largest eigenvalue vector as the primary orientation and look at things like sort of how the cells in your system are oriented, you know, are they all facing up or not? Where could this be a problem or where would this be an issue? So we see for this example, it worked quite well. Can you think on examples where this wouldn't work well? Less accurate. Oh, where the bounding box was very poor. Yeah, but now the aim of this is to find the, the minimum bounding box. Yeah. No, the main of this is to find the orientation of your object, right? Here, this image. Yeah, here the orientation is kind of better defined in the image below. Oh, okay. I would have said it's better defined here because we now know that the largest axis is always going to be this one. Whereas this one, it happened to be y. With other images, it will happen to be x. With other images, they'll be completely diagonal. And so with this one, we know that it's always going to be flat there. But for this specific image? No, no, for all images. Yeah. So you always end up, so the first principal component is always going to be the largest variance in your image, or a largest variance in your data set. So it's always going to be here. Whereas when you look at other images, this could be anywhere. So I guess it would be helpful to have more examples here of that. Um, but the question I was going after with this was, um, if you have objects that are isotropic, so that are round in the first place, and you do a principal component analysis, it will always find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But if your object is completely circular, the eigenvectors don't really mean anything. So they will tell you the orientation is in some random direction, but that random direction doesn't mean anything because your image is perfectly circular in the first place. And so when you look at things like orientation, you need to make sure that the orientation of what you're looking at is actually from an, iso an anisotropic object. Because if it's from an isotropic object, the orientation means nothing. It's just a random number generator. And you can test that out if you're interested in the tools that if you make a bunch of random circles of different sizes and you calculate the orientation, you'll get a whole range of different values. And none of them mean anything because the circle is perfectly isotropic. And you just are ending up with that because of 
um, the algorithm kind of randomly spitting something out, but it doesn't actually mean there's anything in your data that's meaningful that it's looking at. Yeah. Right, and that's exactly what we do. So we come up. Oh, takes a few more slides to get to that. So what we actually do is we define the anisotropy in terms of, where is it? OK, it's one of these formulas. But we actually change the definition of anisotropy <coughs> that instead of using the maximal length and the minimal length, you can actually use the eigenvalues. And when you look at the way most tools have this implemented, they're using the eigenvalues of this principal or the sort of eigen transform or the principal component analysis rather than using the actual lengths measured of a bounding box because these eigenvalues are much better representations of the actual data. Whereas when you look at the pixel values or the bounding box, that having one pixel here massively changes that bounding box size, whereas it doesn't change the inertia tensor or this covariance matrix very much. And so it's much more robust to small changes or fluctuations than looking at something like the bounding box. And we have that in somewhere here. Um, but yeah, and so it's not entirely obvious how to visually represent them. And so one of the things that we do, you know, if you look at this tensor here, how do you represent all those vectors and all those values? And there's not really a trivial way of doing that. And so what we have here is this um, elliptical model where we have the vectors as sort of the primary and the secondary axes and the eigenvalues then show the length of the semi-axis or it's proportional to the length of the semi-axis and so here it's the square root of five times the eigenvalue there and if you're very interested in sort of analytical geometry you can derive that yourself but it's not a particularly fun problem. And so if we look at sort of the elliptical model versus the bounding box, we get sort of a different approximation for the data that we're looking at. We have the anisotropy calculated from either method. And so once you've come up with these semi-axis lengths, you can then calculate the anisotropy from them rather than calculating them from the bounding box. We can now show the ellipse for all of the different samples, and we can see how they fit or don't fit particularly for the sample that looks like Florida or whatever, that's now a much better representation of its extents and orientation. So yeah, we can compare the anisotropy for both models. And one of the things that we see is that here we have the bounding box anisotropy, and here we have the elliptical anisotropy. And there's a huge or a fairly large number of values here that are zero for the bounding box anisotropy because we were just looking at the extents, but very large or a range of different values for the elliptical one. And so this makes it quite clear that the elliptical one is giving us better information on the samples because we don't have all of this information being lost when the bounding box is square but the object isn't. This can also all be applied in 3D. And so if you take a 3D object, it's a little trickier to look at. This is then a 3D representation of the points we have in a ellipse or synthetic round object. You can then show that as different slices. And we have anisotropy like before, but it only gives us information about the shortest and the longest dimension. So those formulas that we have only tell us about those two dimensions. They don't tell us about anything in between. And so one of the important things to remember when moving up dimensions or moving from 2D to 3D, I guess most of you probably won't go to 4D, so that's not too problematic, is that the analysis that you do becomes more complicated. And so anisotropy was very clearly defined in 2D. You know, if, is it circular or does it look like a rod or a pencil? And in 3D, we have sort of an additional degree of freedom. And so we have a sphere like we did before, but we have a number of different ways which it can be elongated. 
So if you have a sphere and you flatten it completely, you can have sort of a very large pancake, and that's very anisotropic. The shortest dimension is much smaller than the largest dimension. But the second dimension is very close to the first. Or you can have a rod where it's very, very small in two directions, so two dimensions, and it's very long in the other. And so that's why you sort of need another metric, which you can call pancakeness or oblateness or whatever you'd like to, which quantifies sort of how that middle axis looks compared to the largest and the smallest one. And so what we do there is we sort of compare the one in the middle to the one at the bottom and normalize it by that. And so you end up with this oblateness factor that tells you if it is prolate or oblate. And so if it's negative one, it indicates that it's very rod-like or prolate. And if it's plus one, it indicates that it's very pancake-like or oblate. Um, so I think that's where we'll stop now, because we're at the time. And then we can continue with the other slides at the beginning of the next lecture. So the exercises, um, as I mentioned, were prepared in nine. So where this is where you have sort of the image generator and there's a new competition or a new data set available called this electron microscopy 3D segmentation where you have exercises in Python. And so this shows you how the component labeling tools work in Python, how you can kind of represent the results in 2D and 3D and then starting to do this kind of analysis on a real problem. So this is electron microscopy data where you're trying to identify cells inside it. And so yeah, like we said before, you have these where you color them by anisotropic or isotropic, and then the tasks will be to take this and then do it in 3D instead of 2D, and what kind of things do you need to change to make sure that that still works well? And then how can you you know, find the largest structures, find the mean values, and everything else. The other exercise associated with this lecture is then sort of a update of the um, digits competition. So has anyone done the digits, the digit classification challenge? Okay, so one person. I think it's quite an interesting problem because it seems very, very simple, but it's pretty difficult to do really well, and it's pretty difficult to out develop algorithms that are better, even when you know a lot about image analysis. And so we have here in the digit recognizer one, kind of a continuation of what we did before, where we just use the mean squared area or the mean absolute error to kind of make a dictionary of different images and then build a classifier to try to figure out what each digit was. And what we do with this is we use component labeling and shape analysis to try to do something better than what we had before. And so what we have here is you take an image, you then segment and label it. So you go from this to the segmented representation you then do the shape analysis so that you get something like the mean anisotropy, mean orientation, total area, total perimeter. And then you build a classifier where you take a digit, you take a bunch of sample digits, you calculate the feature vectors for each of them, and then you find one with the minimum difference to that feature vector. And so you can now classify a new image as... Um, you have an image here, and it guessed 7, and it was actually 9, but you can see what that mean absolute error was. And you can try to improve this analysis and make it use different feature pieces of feature information. And so as we see in this other one before, we have quite a large selection of features that are calculated for us for free by this region properties tool, a number of which that we've already covered. And you can try to include those to see if you can make a classifier that can classify digits even better than what we had before.
You know, the first approach we had was very, very simple. This approach then involves a little bit more of the tools that we're actually learning in this class. And the idea is to see how much you can improve that using your own knowledge and you get very quick feedback so that when you you can process here 28,000 images in a few seconds and then submit it to the competition and see how you rank on the board. And so if we look um, sorry. here, the digit recognizer one, you can then click on your submissions and you can see all of the things that you've submitted and what those scores were. And so we have here the um, mean squared error score was 0.34, the mean absolute error was 0.33, and uh, you know an auto ML approach, which we'll talk about later, was 0.94. And so using just the mean squared error gave us 30% accurate classification. So that's already good, but it's obviously far from perfect, and the best scores are at 99%. Um, Okay, so you're free to start working on the exercises or ask questions.